Hello, everyone. Should we get started? Yes? We had a little thunderstorms where Leah is in, um, in New York, and so she went in and out, but I think we're all, we're all set now. Um, welcome back to our third session of the College of the Atlantic Summer Institute. This is a conversation between COA faculty member Courtney Cullum and Leah Penniman, and it's entitled Farming While Black. I wanted to start by asking if anyone remembered the word I gave you to remember yesterday, if anyone was, was here. Does anyone remember the word? Pessim cook, yes. And do you remember what it meant, Pessim cook? The sandy area to come and spear fish, exactly. So I haven't practiced what Michael Pollan does in experiential education around that, but I can guarantee that if you take a spear and you go to Sand Beach, or you take a spear and you go to the bar, that you will not spear anything, maybe your foot, but there will be no fish, right? Um, most likely the Passamaquoddy and Penobscot people were spearing cod, right? Nookmek is the word for cod, I learned today, nookmek. And um, they've been spearing cod for millennia until about 1850, when began a process of about 130 years of extirpation of cod from Frenchman Bay. They used to say that in Frenchman Bay, you could almost walk across to Skudik Peninsula on the back of codfish. And of course, you can absolutely not do that now. So what the Passamaquoddy were harvesting for their most important source of protein for millennia was taken away from them. And thinking about that and thinking about some of Michael Pollan's words from last night where he was talking about the peyote fields in South Texas and how that resource was also being taken away from Native Americans, I, I start to um, think about the words uh, recompensation, um, reimbursement, remuneration, and in the context of agriculture, those ideas should also uh, arise where we talk about black and brown farmers here in the United States who, after being forcefully removed from Africa and enslaved uh, in the agricultural movement here in, in the eastern United States, um, then during emancipation uh, and the Homestead Act were were really subjugated to a 120 years of, um, of really discrimination, of uh, what Leah calls, um, gosh, I lost it, what is it? She, she called it something really, really special. We'll get to it tonight. But the best stat that I came away with from learning about what is that uh, in 1920, um, 14% of all landholding farmers were black. Today, 2%. And in that exchange were lost 14 million acres of land. And why is that? Um, there's no better person to explore that really revolutionary and terrible change than our guest tonight, Leah Penniman. And in conversation with Leah Penniman is Dr. Courtney Cullum, who's the Partridge Chair in Sustainable Agriculture and Food Systems. Courtney's a native of Detroit, Detroit, Michigan, and came, came east for graduate school and did a PhD at the University of Maine in anthropology and environmental policy. Her dissertation was focused on the Maine blueberry industry and the relationship between pollinators, blueberries, and people. Um, she is at the center of everything we do here around food, including food justice and food sovereignty, and that's why we asked Courtney to do the, the conversation with Leah. Fun fact about Courtney before I bring her up here is that right in the middle of the pandemic, in the fall of 2020, um, we were here in person and Courtney taught four sections of a class called Bees 
in society, which means that a full 12% of the entire student body at the College of the Atlantic was immersed in this question of the role of bees and humanity. I just, I thought that was interesting. I don't know, full 12%. So help me welcome Courtney Cullum to the stage. Can everybody hear me okay? Excellent. And I'm going to sit if you don't mind because I can see, I'm going to see Leah here. Um, thank you, Darren, so much for that introduction. And thank you all for, for joining me here tonight um, in this beautiful place at College of the Atlantic on the unceded territory of the Wabanaki peoples. And it's really fitting that um, while we're here on Mount Desert Island, which is part of the, the territory of the Wabanaki, the people of the Dawn, that we have this conversation about the relationship between food and people and land and how our food system has discriminated against and exploited indigenous farmers, uh, farmers of color, black farmers um, in the past and, and currently today. And I am the, the goal of this conversation is really to help us all think about the role we can play in uprooting racism in the food system. And there's no better person, I think, to, to join in conversation with than Leah Penniman. I am so excited to be speaking today to Leah. Leah is a farmer, a mother, a self-identified soil nerd, a food justice activist, an author, and the co-founder of Soulfire Farm in Grafton, New York. In 2010, Leah co-founded Soulfire Farm with the mission of ending uh, racism in the food system and seeding sovereignty in that system. And she's going to talk to us today about a bunch of amazing programs that are happening at Soulfire Farm to do that work of uprooting racism. And a lot of the things she's going to talk about are featured in her book, Farming While Black, um, Soulfire Farm's Practical Guide to Liberation on the Land. So if you haven't read that, I strongly recommend, recommend that book. So please join me in welcoming Leah Penniman. Hi, Leah. Greetings. Welcome. Hi. And just so everyone knows. Thank you knows, so much for having me. <laughs> absolutely. I, I'm going to let everyone know Leah did lose power a little while ago. Are you without power now? Are you on the generator? Yes. Yeah, so big shout out to my wonderful spouse and partner, uh, Jonah, for installing a whole farm backup generator because we are experiencing major thunderstorms and we are on the generator. So. <laughs> Let's hope everything goes smoothly. It's really wonderful to be with all of you. Let's hope it. They told me that if we lose you, it takes three minutes for your generator to kick in, and I would have to ad lib. So I'm really hoping <laughs> that doesn't happen. So thank you again, Leah. I thought we could start the conversation um, sort of in the middle of your story with the, the co founding of Soulfire Farm. So, can you tell us about the origin of the farm and your relationship to it? Absolutely. So, I fell in love with farming as a young person. I was 16 years old working at the food project. Hold on one sec, I'm getting feedback, so I'm just gonna do this. Um, yeah, I was 16 years old and my very first summer job uh, that I could get was working on a farm and just fell in love with this elegant simplicity of putting a seed in the ground, tending it, you know, being able to feed the community and didn't stop. You know, I worked at a number of farms across rural and urban Massachusetts throughout my uh, teens and early 20s. And what catalyzed us to start Soul Fire is that uh, Joan and I were living in the south end of Albany, which is a neighborhood under food apartheid. That means there are no grocery stores, no farmers markets, you know, really difficult to access fresh food. We didn't have a community garden plot. There's no bus line to get to the grocery store. So the only way that we could get vegetables to feed our family, you know, was to uh, join a community supported agriculture, which is like a subscription for vegetables. It was our biggest expense after our rent. And we had to walk over two miles in order to um, go and get that food. So we'd pile it on top of Nishima and Emmett in the stroller and then uh, go down the hill, make our soup for the week. So when our neighbors found out that we knew how to farm, they started encouraging us to start a farm for the people. And that's where the idea of Soul Fire Farm came to be. We wedded ourselves to 80 acres of unceded Mohican territory up in the mountains of upstate New York. 
And uh, through you know a combination of grit and uh, youthful naivete, managed to uh, coax these mountainside clay soils with no topsoil, just hard pan and no infrastructure um, over time into what Soul Fire Farm is, which is a community farm that provides no and low cost food and medicine on a weekly basis to families across the region and uh, provides educational programming and organizes and agitates all kinds of things we'll get into. Uh, but yeah, it did start with neighbors saying, you know, can we get in on those fresh vegetables and when are you gonna start a farm for us? There's already so much you've said that I, I wanna dig deeper on. I noticed the term you use is food apartheid and the term that the USDA and a lot of organizations use is food deserts. and actively rejects that term. So could you talk a little bit about why, how food apartheid is different from uh, food deserts and why it matters? For sure. So um, I have to shout out one of my mentors, Karen Washington, who's a black farmer at Rise and Root and the founder of Black Urban Growers, because when I was using the term food desert, which is the government's term for a, you know, a census tract, a zip code, essentially, where you don't have um, the grocery stores and access to food where there's high levels of poverty. Um, they call it a food desert. But the challenge with that term is that, you know, especially for those of us who are ecologists and scientists, we know that a desert is a, a thriving ecosystem that has a rightful place on the earth. And when we call a situation of food segregation where certain people have food opulence, you know, Trader Joe's and the farmers markets and Whole Foods, and other people have uh, KFC and the corner store, uh, hunger, diabetes, heart disease, all these diet related illnesses. When we call that a desert, we are presuming that that's natural and inevitable, when in fact there is nothing natural or inevitable about the situation of, of food apartheid, which really is a human created system of segregation that builds on a whole legacy of um, housing discrimination in the form of redlining, you know, discriminatory lending, ghettoization through uh, restrictive covenants and zoning that's kept people in certain neighborhoods you know, divestment, urban renewal, there's a whole history of why your zip code is one of the leading determiners of your life expectancy, one of the leading determiners of incarceration rates, of access to fresh food, of um, the quality of schools, the, the air quality. Um, the zip code is a major predictor of these things, and it is because a legacy of uh, discrimination and ghettoization of black and brown communities that resulted in that. So when we call it food apartheid, uh, it might sound like a harsh term, but I actually think of it as a hopeful term because we're saying like people created this and anything that people created, people can also undo. You know, there is a way that we can act together to fix the situation rather than the inevitability of a desert. And one of my, my favorite books is this book, Beginning to End Hunger, which we talked about the other day by Dr. M. Jahi Chappelle. And Jahi uses this term, um, active optimism, this notion that we have to believe we can end hunger and we can do it by, by being critical, but, but doing the work. Um, and I see that okay. in a lot of what you're doing at Soulfire Farm to, to eliminate and address food apartheid and uproot racism. So can you talk a bit about who you're serving uh, through the food you're producing on the farm and what some of those programs look like? For sure. And yeah, I just, I can't say enough about Jahi and, and the wonderful work that SAFON, the Southeast African American Farmers Organic Network is doing. I'm sure we'll get to that later in the conversation, but it's always wonderful to hear a, a colleague's work uplifted. Uh, as far as you know, what we're doing on the farm, one of the things that really distinguishes Soul Fire Farm from some of the organizations in the space is that we are led by the people most impacted by these issues of racial injustice in the food system. So we are an Afro-Indigenous led, people of color led organization, predominantly um, women, non-binary and trans folks, uh, folks who have experienced food insecurity in their lives, folks who have worked the land. Um, and I mention that because I actually don't think it's possible to impose solutions from the outside of a community on a community and have those be successful. Um, and it's something that is, is core to our value system. So there's three basic arenas that we work, right? We talked about the food one. So we grow a whole lot of food and medicine over a hundred different varieties, cultivars. Uh, many of them are from our heritage, like the Platte Zaiti tomato from uh, my maternal homeland. You know, we grow many varieties of okra. We grow uh, some of some seeds that the Mohican nation has asked us to rematriate. So varieties of maize and bee balm, uh, or number six, as they call it, that have been rematriated. So many, many of the crops that we grow have story. All of them have story. Um, some have story that's heritage specific. And then we box that up every 
Thursday and we bring it to the doorsteps of people who need it most in our community. So in our, our uh, solidarity share program, a lot of refugee families, folks impacted by incarceration, folks impacted by poverty, um, all families of color currently in the program. And then we partner with some institutions like the Refugee Center, a network of churches, the Free Food Fridge, uh, which is a really powerful movement to get that food out. And uh, it just brings me such joy and pride because every week when we box it up, this is not like seconds, um, or throwaway food. This is top shelf, you know, beautiful pasture raised eggs. We include uh, meat in our share on a monthly basis. We have, you know, fresh herbs from the lands, you know, beautiful vegetables. And this is what folks are getting at whatever price they can afford down to no price at all. Um, and a lot of the folks in our solidarity sh share program have said to us, you know, we're interested in learning how to grow food as well. So birthed out of that and credit to my colleague Amani for creating the Soul Fire in the City program, which is uh, a program where we actually go and build raised beds with community members in their yard or church or school, then provide the soil, the seeds, the, the plants um, so that folks can grow their own. And I'm actually headed down to Troy in a couple of weeks to teach a chickens in the city workshop because a lot of our gardens gardeners want to know how to add, you know, laying hens. And we do a number of other programs layered on top as far as training and education and advocacy. But something that I love about Soul Fire is that we continue to be grounded in that hands on work. You know, I have a lot of stains and calluses um, on my hands. I have stained feet because we had a community work day today. And uh, we're very, very grounded in listening to the land and providing direct survival programs for our community. And then the more like theoretical and ephemeral and um, organizing work, which is also important continues to be rooted in that hands-on experience, if that makes sense. Absolutely, yeah. And I, I was reading a bit about some of the practices you use on the farm and the connection to the land. And I, I heard a story somewhere, I think it was you who said you wanted to, um, you wanted to have a, a pond on the property and you, you asked for 10 years. So could you talk about, like, what is that relationship sure. with the land like and what happened with this pond? Absolutely. So some of the, well, I'll start with a story because one of the places where I trained and learned how to farm was in Ghana, West Africa in my early 20s. And I've been really blessed to get to rock with farmers in, in Mexico and Vieques and Haiti, other places in the world. Um, Via Campesina is, is our uh, international organization of pe peasant farmers. But all that to say, when I was living in Ghana, um, the Queen Mothers, who are like the OG spiritual activists, do a lot in the community for the environment and for uh, people really were challenged by what they perceived as a practice in um, among Westerners, among uh, colonial USers of not praying or dancing or singing or pouring libation or doing anything when they planted a seed and then sort of demanding uh, growth of that seed. And when I confirmed that that was, you know, almost universal, they said that that's why you're all sick. You know, you're all sick because you treat the earth as a commodity and not as a living, breathing relative. And that stuck with me because even as someone who practiced organic and did, you know, believed in you know, not putting pesticides um, on the earth, there still is an, an extra leap to see the earth as sovereign, a big extra leap. And uh, we're not perfect at it, but what we try to practice with the land is, um, is a rights of nature, um, is consent <coughs> for the projects that we do. So an example of that is there was a swampy area um, that existed on the land when we came out here in 2006. And it was just in our mind, like begging to be a pond for irrigation, swimming, fish. Uh, but we use a system of divination um, that I was in, trained in, um, in the Yoruba religion of Arisha Ifa practice. There's a, a system of divination that you use to communicate with spirit. And so asked if it was okay to dig out the pond and got a no. And we asked every year uh, for many years and continued to get a no um, until eventually we built what I believe is a deep enough relationship of respect and trust with the land um, that we finally received consent um, to dig up the pond. It was conditional consent. There were some safety measures to put in place and a uh, certain type of rituals that we needed to keep alive on the land, but did get consent. Now we have a beautiful pond for swimming and irrigation and fish, but we, you know, we don't just cut down a whole bunch of trees or till up a field. We ask permission. And it's hard for us, you know, it's hard because we're so used to human supremacy that the idea of not just appreciating nature, but really deferring to the trees and the hawks and the soil life as our elder siblings 
to whom we owe deference and respect, to whom we need to listen um, and heed advice is very, very challenging. Um, even for those of us who profess kind of environmental or ecological values, we still want to be in charge, I think, um, because we've been so conditioned to be in charge. So it's been a, a big lesson in ecological humility, trying to practice that and trying to practice like letting go of my and our ideas of what should be. Um, and instead just trust that if we if we listen to what nature is telling us um, that things will work out better. Um, and so far, you know, so far they have. So we'll keep it up. So how does that, what are other ways that that spirituality and relationship with the land, how does that shape your other practices at the farm? I know you use a lot of practices that are, are commonly today called regenerative or sustainable practices. And these are practices that are rooted in thousands of years of indigenous knowledge and technology. So can you talk a little bit about some of those other practices you're using at the farm? Absolutely. Um, so I sort of hear two parts to your question. One is about sort of zooming out on spirituality. And I guess I'll just say briefly to that point that, you know, we are a multicultural community with folks practicing all different religions or no religion. So people bring their earth-based practices. You know, our family also practices Judaism and we honor the Shemitah, you know, the Sabbath of the land. Uh, we honor the um, the corners and gleanings, the law of Peah, where you're, you're sharing your harvest and um, people have brought Buddhist practice to bear. People have brought a Christian practice to bear. So I want to name uh, that there are in all of our spiritual traditions, ways of understanding uh, an environmental ethic, and in some cases, even um, nature supremacy. So as far as the practices on the land that come from our heritage, some are spiritual, some are more tangible and physical, uh, but almost everything that we consider organic or regenerative can be traced to indigenous and often Afro-indigenous roots. Um, take, for example, raised beds. Raised beds is the practice of, you know, mounding up the the soil so that you can control water flow, so that you can concentrate fertility, increase friability of the soil. And we're so grateful for our raised beds because we've had massive flooding across our region. And the only reason we still have a farm is because of these permanent raised beds. And these come from the Ovambo people of Namibia who when the colonial government wanted to force them off their land um, and sort of guarantee that these other lands that they'd be going to were just as good, they said, maybe so, but we've invested in these raised beds. I mean, we've put um, cattle urine and termite ash and muck from wetlands piled up. And so we've actually improved the soil and there's no way you can give that back to us uh, and put up a fight you know, against the colonial government. Um, when we think about composting, which is an almost universal practice in organic, uh, we can trace the first documentation of composting back to Cleopatra around 50 BCE, who had a whole cadre of priests whose full-time study was dedicated to the habits of earthworms and who actually would have people put to death for harming worms. And, you know, while I don't support state violence in that way, it's pretty astounding that Cleopatra's soil ethos was so high that she actually wanted to sheet vermicompost the entire Nile River Delta. And, you know, uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture scientists have went in the 1940s and did soil cores and found that during the time of her rule, uh, the worm castings were much higher than they were than uh, periods before and after. Um, you know, in so many examples, Dr. George Washington Carver, and uh, we can thank for the modern organic movement, you know, two whole generations before Rodale got people cover cropping, composting, uh, doing silvo pasture with their pigs. And people thought he was out of his mind, like you're gonna grow a crop and then just turn it back into the earth and not even harvest it. That's what cover cropping is, right? It feeds the soil. Um, but he was able to really save Southern soils from demise um, of, of the monocropping of tobacco and cotton. So there's so many, you know, many, many examples that that sort of became the heart of Farming While Black was uncovering these examples of noble black agrarianism and our contribution to sustainable ag. Uh, but it's been very exciting for me as a farmer to learn that so many of the practices that were taught to me as a historical or strictly European um, actually are connected to my and our heritage and that we all have a place in the story. Those are beautiful stories and it's just, yeah, I think I remember being in college and being like, oh, there's this thing called sustainability that my generation is discovering. And then you're like, oh no, 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 no. Right? <laughs> right? Like we we think we're inventing this concept and we are not. Um, another thing I heard you say a few minutes ago is you mentioned 
the sovereignty of the land. And I know sovereignty is a big part of the, the programs you're running at Soul Fire Farm. So can you talk about what that means for, for you and, and your, your team at Soul Fire Farm? What, what is food sovereignty? Oof. Sovereignty is such a powerful word. And I think it's not possible to talk about sovereignty independent from um, indigenous folks leadership in that movement. It really is a term that came out of international um, indigenous movements against agribusiness in particular. Um, and I mentioned Via Campesina in passing earlier, but that is a million strong six continent peasant movement um, that has just done a phenomenal job of one, feeding the world, you know, over 70% of our calories still come from smallholder farms across the world, which are more resilient and more productive when measured on a multi-year time scale than conventional. Um, conventional, you know, beats us on productivity with a one season time scale. But as soon as you factor in floods, droughts, pest outbreaks, and climate chaos in general, um, you know, conventional loses in terms of yield. So shout out to the peasant movements for, for really helping us um, understand that there is a way to grow food without trashing the planet and without exploiting people. And hetero patriarchal capitalism has got us pretty confused because our whole US food system is based on stolen land and exploited labor. That's the DNA of the food system and it hasn't changed. 98% uh, of the rural land by value and 95% by acres is white owned, you know, 85% of the hands that grow our food are folks of color who are not protected by the same labor laws as other industries and on and on and on. So stolen land, exploited labor. But what food sovereignty is, is really the opposite of that. And um, I often think of this image that my daughter Nishima uh, gave to me when she was a young child, she's now 18 and all grown up, but she said, you know, the food system is everything it takes to get sunshine onto your plate. So I think of all the steps along the way that food takes from sunshine to plate, from who owns the land um, to where the seeds come from and are those seeds sovereign uh, to how the, the people who actually work the land are treated. Are we talking about dignified wages and working conditions, um, ownership or pathways to ownership, co-ops, uh, democracy in the workplace, right? Um, all the way to, you know, who's getting to distribute that food and how are those businesses owned and who's profiting to, to the eaters and um, that system of food apartheid that we have, which puts the environmental benefits of good food in the hands of a few. And then, and then the many are experiencing these chronic diet related illnesses and hunger. Um, you know, how do we make sure that everyone has access to culturally appropriate, healthy, affordable food? So food sovereignty is all of that. And sometimes when we talk about these issues of injustice in the food system, we're only looking at just the sliver of the eater. And people say, well, if you just have food banks or food stamps and you distribute food, it's sort of solved. But we're not um, interested only in that. Of course, everyone needs full bellies. That's very, very important. But we're actually interested in looking at a, a broader and stickier question of control and democratization at all levels of the food system. So um, it's gonna be from land reform, you know, land back movement to reparations, it needs to be part of that, um, to farm worker rights needs to be part of that. And all, all of those pieces together um, form that package that is food sovereignty, which is everyone having a say, including the earth, having a say in how we're producing and sharing our food. Oh, there's so much, so much to say there about labor and reparations. And it makes me think about, you often hear these arguments that our food system is broken, right? Like if people are unhealthy from the food that they're eating and um, if we are dependent on the labor of migrants and if we are exploiting people and animals and plants, uh, and people are hungry, the food system must be broken. And a lot of food justice activists and folks like Eric Holt Jimenez, who is the former executive director of Food First, says, no, no, the system isn't broken. It's working exactly as it was intended to function, right? A capitalist food system depends on exploitation. So we need to, to think about a different model. I wonder what you think about that. Do you think the system is broken? Do you think the system's working as it was intended? And if so, how do we uproot that system? Mm -hmm. Well, both can certainly be true. Um, I think the food system is working as it was designed and it was designed by property owning cis white men to concentrate wealth and power. So it's doing that. It's absolutely doing that. Um, you know, trillions and trillions of dollars flowing to the few um, at the expense of our health, 
um, at the expense of our biosphere, you know, the very, the very lungs of the planet. Um, it's pretty overwhelming and, and devastating when you really think about the magnitude of the impact of the industrial agriculture system um, on the basics that, that we need to survive. Is that broken though? Yeah, you know, because I didn't design it and I don't want it to work that way. So it's broken from the perspective of all life and the needs of all life. And I don't know, something that I think about in this moment around brokenness um, is, is the sort of the story of maize, you know, as folks probably know, maize or corn um, can be traced back eight or 9,000 years uh, to this continent when, you know, indigenous folks in what is now central Mexico painstakingly uh, did plant breeding, did plant selection in order to turn Teosinte into the maize that we have and the many, many varieties of maize that we have. But maize was was really seen as, and continues to be seen as a sacred crop, as the mother of all crops of life, um, as a gift from the divine, and as belonging in a trio. So maize grows, of course, with her sisters, beans and squash, the maize grows tall, provides the support. Um, also diet, dietarily speaking, you know, provides the starch. Beans wind up around the corn, uh, they fix nitrogen because they are a legume and they collaborate with rhizobial bacteria. Um, provide the protein for the diet, and then squash grows wide and um, shades out the weeds. It actually produces a, a small, a, a very gentle insecticide that supports the bean, also a natural insecticide. And then the squash, you know, the flesh has vitamins and minerals. The seed has oils and fats. Um, so these three sisters together are collaborating and providing the basic nutrition that humans need. And it is you know, it's been measured that when you plant these crops together on a per acre basis, you're getting 40% more yield than if you did like a patch of corn, a patch of beans and a patch of squash, mostly because you're using uh, layers, you know, you're using the lateral height instead of kind of wasting that. And what happened to corn, right? Because corn was a gift that was freely shared with the colonizer um, by indigenous people, you know, across the continent in order to keep them alive. And corn was ripped away from her sisters, turned into monocrop. Um, it was converted into genetically modified organisms, terminator seeds. It was converted into biofuels. Um, it was converted into corn syrup that essentially, you know, metaphorically pumped into the veins of our children, driving a diabetes crisis. Um, it has wiped out whole prairie ecosystems. And so corn has been weaponized. Um, and to me, very much symbolizes this brokenness in the food system from an indigenous and Afro-indigenous perspective. And I think that part of the work, like sort of like, when do we know we've arrived, right? When corn is back with her sisters and that's that's the way of things and, and all of those corollaries, all of those cultural corollaries. But when we see an agriculture uh, where corn, beans and squash are working together, where they're actually feeding human beings, uh, where they are honoring that genetic and cultural diversity and heritage, um, where they're supporting biodiversity rather than trashing it, right? That, that would be, um, a signpost that we're close to where we need to be in terms of healing the food system. That reminds me of um, our, one of our conversations we had as part of the Institute this morning was with Congresswoman Shelley Pingree, who's our represent, one of our representatives here in Maine. And she was talking about um, you know, policies that can uh, reward farmers for practices that are um, healing the soil and um, producing food that is good for people. So I'm, and, and one of the things you said in our planning conversation was, what can we get behind, right? Like what are things we can get mm -hmm. behind to help uproot racism in the food system? So could you talk a little bit about any policies that you find really exciting or movements right now that are moving us forward in this work? Yeah, I mean, that's the good news. It's a really exciting time to be alive because there are so many solutionaries. And I would say there's, you know, as far as what can we get behind, there's two basic categories, right? There's policies and there's institution building. Both sound really dry, but they're actually not, right? So when we talk about policies, you know, this is in some ways a culmination of collective thinking about what are the rules and norms that we need in order to heal the food system. So one of the exciting policies that I had the privilege of working on as one in a number, hundreds of us, is the Justice for Black Farmers Act, um, introduced by Booker and Warren. And it does a bunch of powerful things. One is it figures out how to redistribute 
the 14 million acres of land that was stolen uh, from the black community. That's huge. Like when have we seen a land reform, you know, piece of legislation? Um, it establishes a conservation core, sort of post depression era style, you know, civilian conservation core, but it's for farmers, regenerative farmers to train on regenerative farms and to learn specifically in the black community from elder to young person in a way where that person's, the learner's wage is supported um, through a, you know, through a, a public fund. Um, it provides investigations into the rampant discrimination in the U.S. Department of Agriculture and provisions to rectify that because USDA dollars have been going disproportionately to white farmers since the beginning of those programs. And that's something that continued, you know, in the most recent COVID relief bill, there was all of this uh, food box aid and over 97 percent of it went to white farmers. And this is um, billions of dollars, you know, of funding that was distributed. Um, so. That's a really exciting piece of legislation. There's an older piece of legislation, the Fairness for Farm Workers Act, that still hasn't gotten passed and kind of blows my mind because, you know, in the 1930s, uh, we were able to pass uh, labor laws that codified such things as the 40 hour work week, the right to a day off, the right to unionize and collectively bargain, um, child labor protections. And these were not extended to farm workers explicitly because they were people of color. And we still haven't updated the law to include them. So that's wild. And that obviously needs to be um, changed yesterday and the day before. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention policy wise, it's not a bill yet, but sort of the Green New Deal and the Red, Black and Green New Deal and all of those coalitions that are going on to really uh, figure out what this next economy is going to look like in a way that centers uh, climate justice and racial justice. And then as far as institution building, Again, not dry. Institutions are when we come together and decide that we're more than individuals and we're going to actually build the world we want to see. And so these are land trusts, co-ops, community finance vehicles. And I'm super excited about what's happening in the Northeast, where many of you all are, uh, where we've created an ecosystem of black led farming orgs like the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust, the Black Farmer Fund, um, Corbin Hill Food Project, Soul Fire Farm and others. And we're working together to provide wraparound support for this rising generation of farmers. So they can say, I go to Neefolk for land. I'm going to go to Soul Fire for training. I'm going to go to the Black Farmer Fund to get uh, my startup capital. I can organize with uh, Black Farmers United to make a policy suggestion. And I can sell my food to New York City through Corbin Health Food Project. So there's a way of really deciding, like, how do we want to design this uh, food economy and then building the institutions to fill in those pieces, not waiting for permission or for someone to do it for us, but actually having community led institutions. So those are things we can really get behind, like throwing resources in the direction of these um, black and brown led community institutions and supporting campaigns around changing the laws that make it almost impossible to survive on land without exploiting somebody or something. So um, really, really excited about the, the momentum that exists behind these initiatives. That, that momentum is so exciting. And one thing I really admire about you and your work is in everything I read, you know, you, you become a spokesperson for this movement to elevate black, brown, and indigenous farmers, but you always highlight that it's a part of a movement, right? It's a part of collective action. And clearly for all of this work to happen, there's solidarity and there's partnership and there are all of these organizations working together. So can you talk a bit about that? Like, about the collaboration between your colleagues at Soul Fire Farm and about all of the folks working in this movement right now. I'm so glad you said that because I think we get addicted to these hero narratives, right? And we think that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, in blessed memory is, you know, the civil rights movement or Vandana Shiva is ecofeminism. But of course, it's always like a collective effort. Um, and hero narratives can be dangerous for so many reasons. They disempower us. Um, they pedestalize leaders, you know, they dehumanize people. So really glad that you said that. And, you know, folks will often ask at Soulfire, you know, why don't you all just get bigger or franchise or open up like branches everywhere? And we are constantly looking to the earth as I said, our older sibling and as our example. And, you know, when there's a pine tree on the edge of a forest that is getting a lot of extra sunlight and producing a lot of extra sugars, um, she doesn't actually franchise. She doesn't grow like 10 times taller than the other trees. What she'll do is put those extra sugars down into a network of fungal mycelium to share um, with the other trees. And in turn, you know, messages and minerals and resources are being 
you know, exchanged in the super organism. And they're able to, in that collaboration, warn each other of pest outbreaks. They can mast together so they can overwhelm the herbivores. And we think about that in terms of what is our methodology at Soul Fire Farm of growth. And it really is lateral. It really is about cross-pollination. And so we certainly support our alumni in, in, in gaining resources and access to platform. And we have amazing you know, farmers all across the country that have been through Soulfire's program, like Katatumbo Farm Co-op in Chicago, you know, um, High Hog Farm in Grayson, Georgia, Harry Tubman Freedom Farm in Carolina. So many, many like incredible projects. So that's one example of, of how we're thinking about um, collaboration, perhaps, perhaps even more importantly, is that some of these deeply established organizations like the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, which is 53 years old and has been doing like black co-ops for you know, way before I was born, figuring out how do we work together on common campaigns. And so we've created national coalitions that work on um, policy. We have managed to create a fellowship together that um, 10 organizations are part of this fellowship. And it's our way of providing a salary and mentorship and professional development to a cohort of 10 rising generation farmers every single year. And what more powerful message to this next generation, right, than to see all of these well-established, reputable organizations working together to like have their backs and saying like, we got you and we have all of these um, resources that we're gonna bring to bear to make sure that you're successful. Um, so I'm really excited about that. I don't think it's possible for any individual or any organization to do this on our own. It's a really big task. Um, we're pretty entrenched in the industrial food system. So to really uproot that um, is gonna take a collective effort across the spectrum. And, and the only way to do it is through collaboration. So that just prompted my curiosity about something. Are you organized as a cooperative at Soul Fire Farm? So we actually have two entities. So the land itself is owned by a co-op. And so the people who live and work on the land are member owners of that co-op with like a one member, one vote structure. Um, the land has veto power and the Mohican nation has a cultural respect easement on the land. So um, no Mohican citizen could ever be excluded from using this land for certain purposes. Um, so that's the, the land ownership structure. And I put ownership in quotes because it's a problematic concept of enclosure and ownership. So we're you know trying to finagle the law to approximate uh, collective ways of sharing land that are part of our heritage. Um, and as far as Soul Fire Farm, you know, that we're talking about here, it is a nonprofit organization. So it's a 501c3 with a board of directors, uh, with a staff. I'm a member of that staff. And it is a member owner of the co-op. So it's like a tenant, you know, of the co-op doing its operations here. It's certainly the tenant with the biggest footprint. Because uh, if you came to Soul Fire, he would, that's the main thing you'd see is, is the programs and the work and, and the community spaces. Can you talk about that decision to, to form a co-op? A lot of our students at CUA are super excited about the possibility of co-ops and they're looking at all of these different ways of structuring farms and seeing like, oh, there seems like there's so much potential in this idea of cooperation. So what, what informed that decision? And Oh my goodness, so co-ops, what can I say? Um, there is a, a wonderful book that I think was published might be 1910, don't quote me on that exactly, but a Dubois book that explored black cooperatives. Um, and then there's some more recent uh, books on, on co-ops. Um, it'll come to me a minute, I just went out of my mind, but it'll come to me at the end of this. So definitely read about the history of black co-ops. And I mentioned that because I think there's something really powerful about reclaiming uh, cooperative business structure as part of heritage. And again, not as a new idea, it goes way, way back. And even before the 1900s, sort of the precursor to co-op that I'm most familiar with um, in Ghana, West Africa, amongst the Krobo people is the HUSA system, H-U-Z-A of land ownership, where family members and close friends would get together, you know, collectively buy a parcel of land, run a palm oil business um, or another farm business together and have some profit sharing models. Um, also a precursor to some of our, our credit unions, which are among the most popular co-op form would be the SUSU um, of, of the Caribbean and before that of West Africa where women pool money and the Susuma who's the respected elder sort of 
distributes out these loans and grants from that collective pool. So it goes like way, 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 way back. It, you might even say it's the OG form of economic organization in Afro-Indigenous communities. And that was part of the reason that we decided to form a co-op. We were looking at different models of uh, land ownership and without getting too technical, you know, uh, there are advantages and disadvantages with a C3 structure, with a land trust structure. We wanted to make sure that people could build equity um, and be able to pass down secure land tenure to their children. That wasn't based on sort of board politics, but really based on um, lineage. And so that was really important to us. It was important to us that children could have a vote. And in New York State, there's some restrictions on, on uh, particular type of structures. Uh, and we also wanted to make sure that even people who couldn't buy into the co-op could still have a vote. Um, so we ended up going with this two-tiered uh, manager-managed LLC co-op thing. So all that to say, it's really good to have a good legal team. And many of the university, um, university law schools will provide pro bono legal services to farms and nonprofits and community organizations. So that was helpful to us in the decision-making process. Um, but I think even more so, yeah, aside from the technical, there's sort of a psycho-spiritual uh, satisfaction to finally being able to figure out how to get these values that we have around rights of nature, around um, shared sovereignty with indigenous people, around collectivizing decision-making, like to figure out how we can make that work in the system of white man's law um, was really satisfying for us. And we wanted to be able to provide the paperwork and template to some of our other comrades so they don't maybe have to go through such a long, arduous decision-making process. We can say like, here's all this research that we did and here's our bylaws and uh, lease agreements and all of that as templates that you can use. So that was really important to us too. And we've made that available to a number of, of groups over time. Yeah, thanks for answering that. I know that can be like kind of a nerdy t technical question, but I think this is something farmers are really grappling with right now, right? It's like, at what scale makes sense? Small farms are struggling, medium-sized farms are struggling, like, and there's a lot of enthusiasm and excitement around cooperation right now. So I'm gonna ask one more question and then we're gonna open it up for questions from the audience because I know everyone um, has things they'd like to ask of you, but I wanted to ask about climate change. There was a recent article in the Washington Post where you noted that black, brown, indigenous Latinx uh, farmer or folks are those most impacted by climate change. And also we know agriculture is a, a major, can be a major contributor to climate change. So can you talk about your thinking around that and the practices that you all are doing at Soul Fire Farm to try to mitigate climate change? Oof, that's like the topic, right? Especially this week, as you know, yesterday our air quality was terrible because of smog from the fires on the west you know it was just settled right here on the mountains and um two weeks ago we had some of the worst flooding that our region has seen uh 12 inches of rain in just a week um we've had horrible pest outbreaks we've had winters that weren't winter and didn't you know didn't kill back the pests as they usually do so it really is very alive and i think about a lot i have two teenage children who experience climate grief and climate anxiety very viscerally you know, my daughter's like, what world did you all leave us? Um, so it's a lot. And and it is true that black and brown communities are on the front lines in terms of impacts, whether you're looking at island communities that are literally disappearing or the ever extending dry season in West Africa. And um, there's not even enough time in the wet season for a lot of crops to reach maturity because the season has shortened and plants just can't adapt that fast, whether you look at you know, the hurricanes and other unnatural disasters impacting the Caribbean and um, southern parts of the United States, it's just on and on, you know, who's fighting those wildfires, who's on the front lines. Uh, but I think it's important to note that it's not just black and brown folks who are like, quote, the victims of climate chaos, but have been the innovators of those solutions. And much of what we know about drawing down carbon from the atmosphere into the soil comes from black and indigenous practices like cover cropping, raised beds, heavy mulching, no-till, perennial polycultures. And, you know, just at our farm in the past decade or so, we've been able to build 10 inches of topsoil and sequester tens of thousands of pounds of carbon, um, increase soil biodiversity, soil respiration rates, all of that um, using these ancestral practices. 
And that's one of the reasons why it's really important in these climate conversations that we that we center the voices and expertise of those people who are most impacted. And and it is, you know, it is carbon drawdown. And in some ways it's kind of I won't say it's too late, but we do have to look at mitigation. And and the good news is a lot of the practices that draw down carbon also mitigate. You know, the farms around us experience devastating losses. And I was terrified, but I'm looking out my window in, you know, a big flood and our on contour raised beds are slowly allowing the water to percolate and infiltrate and we don't lose crops, right? And so, um, you know, having our fruit trees interspersed with our annuals in that permanent root structure, just grabbing onto the sloped hillside and we, we lose very few crops. So I think that the same strategies that will help us to draw down carbon are also the strategies that are going to help us mitigate the inevitable impacts of climate change that we're already seeing. Thank you for, for sharing that. So I, I know other folks want to ask questions, so um, I'll open it up now and uh, we'll take some questions for Leah. Leah, it's obvious um, from hearing you speak that you've taken great care in um, being intentional about how you set up the structure of the farm. And I'm curious how that extends to your labor practices, because I know burnout is a huge problem on farms, okay. even small farms that um, try to be intentional, try to be supportive of their staff, have a really difficult time with this. Um, and so I'm curious how you maintain your staff and what practices you might use to ensure their mental and physical well-being. That is such an important question. And I have to say that we have an easier time of it than a lot of farmers. And so I want to mention that because I don't want to make anyone else feel like, oh, my goodness. Um, we are a 501c3 nonprofit. We do not rely on the sale of vegetables to pay our workers. And so because we have a diversified revenue stream, we can pay people living wages, um, which is huge and almost impossible uh, if a farm at our scale was only relying on crop sales. Uh, we can offer um, 20 days a year of paid vacation. We can offer year round employment rather than seasonal employment, salaried rather than um, hourly. Uh, people can choose to work part time or full time and um, you know have health you know, a health reimbursement account, a retirement account. So a lot of these things that even farmers who want to be able to offer can't because of the economics. And so I just want to mention our privilege there, like our structural privilege. Um, and there's a lot of history about like why we decided because we used to be um, a commercial farm and kind of made a decision to pivot. And there's a lot that went into that. I would say another thing that um, is really different about our farm is that nobody here is a full-time farmer. Um, everyone here has an administrative or educational component to their work and a farming component of their work. So I would say the max on-farm hours in a typical week that someone is working is like 25 to 27. And so that balance of like physical labor with mental labor or people labor um, has also mitigated it. And then the final thing, which is a more recent shift, is we've been shifting the farm both to more climate resilient practices, but also um, at the same time, their uh, labor saving practices. So having more of the farm in perennials and less in annuals, more in grazing land, uh, less in these like specialty crops has meant that like the overall number of labor hours that are required by the farm are lower, which supports some of those other goals. Um, I know that there's a broader question under there is like, how do we all do that? And I think that the nonprofit structure in a little bit is a shortcut around that. You know, that's not going to solve the problem. To fundamentally solve a problem of burnout and labor, we need to change the labor laws. Uh, we need to change uh, price support structure so that farmers actually have the income to pay fair wages and have enough redundancy that they can offer vacation time, right? Um, and diversity of tasks and so on and so forth. So I think it's a structural issue for sure. Um, but in the meantime, you know, certainly, you know, every farmer can consider what would it be like to have some paid sick days? What would it look like to um, evenly distribute wages amongst the people who are there? And so, you know, there's some wage equity and so on and so forth. We 
we have a number of other questions. <laughs> Hi, Leah. Thank you so much for, um, for speaking with us today. Um, so in your, in your discussion about, you know, creating a relationship with the land and asking, uh, you know, the land uh, for permission, specifically with your story of, of the pond, it seems like um, you put a lot of importance in not just asking, but in the respecting of the answer, even when that answer is no, even when it's the answer you don't necessarily want to hear. Um, and it seems to me that maybe that that is one of the things that we're really lacking in the kind of dominant food system and the kind of dominant capitalist practices that are very extractive. And I was wondering if maybe you could speak about what uh, kind of a transforming agricultural culture and econo economics to really respect um, the no when you get that answer from the land. What would that, what would that look like to you? For other people or for us? Well, what does it look like for you and what do you think it could look like for maybe, you know, expanding that? Respecting the no. Wow, we, I, as a culture, we're not very good with boundaries, are we? <laughs> I feel like respecting the no could really be extrapolated to um, talking about consent and relationships, you know, talking about so many things. So, um, for us, I mean, it started with an ethical imperative where we really believed that was the right thing to do and we were committed to retraining ourselves. I mean, so much for me, you know, I practice um, two indigenous religions of my people, uh, Vodun and, and the Ifa, worship of Ifa. And so much of that has been trying to deprogram uh, a really Western domination mindset and, and internalize the belief that this dichotomy between like good and evil that's imposed that uh, the idea of human beings being in charge of creation is really imposed. So for me, that's where it started. You know, for other folks, I I don't see any other way than a cultural shift. I'm not sure that you can impose um, the respect of a no. I think that it would be beautiful, right, if we could all find the place in our own lineage where uh, predomination, where there was a belief that we are part of things and that we belong. Um, and that there's some wisdom outside of ourselves that's worthy of listening to. And in connecting with that, you know, experience that transformation from within. And I believe it's accessible. You know, uh, Dr. George Washington Carver would go out every morning at 4 a.m. to listen to the flowers and the trees and believe that he could hear the voice of God through the flowers and the trees. Um, and it would instruct him about his day's activities. It would instruct him about what crops to grow, um, what sort of uh, inventions to create. And we all have access to that. You know, there's nature, as he says, is a limitless broadcasting system and we just tune in. So if we could cultivate that art of listening, I think the imperative to heed those boundaries would become evident for us. We have time for several more questions. I see one here, one over here. Oh. Hello. I, I'm wondering if you have animals at Soul Fire and how we come to terms with animal ag agriculture and the place that it, it plays with uh, climate crisis ethically and our health and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, if you could s speak a little bit about coming to terms with um, animals a part of our diet, yes or no, and the impact that they have. It's, it's, a, it's a very delicate subject. <laughs> Thank you. Sure, I love that you all are asking real questions, like let's talk about it, labor animals. I mean, the first thing is, I really wanna differentiate between um, confined animal feeding operations and industrial agriculture, um, versus an indigenous way of understanding um, our relationship to animals. And so, um, and I'll say this as someone who was a vegan for 13 years and then actually spent a lot of time in rural Ghana where people have a totally different relationship with animals. So there are people of the buffalo, right, who are integrated with buffalo, people of the salmon. Um, there are people of the cattle in, um, in East Africa. Um, there are people of the guinea fowl in Northern Africa. And so this relationship, a sustainable relationship between human beings and animals, whether wild or domesticated as food has existed for most of human history. And it's only in the past few generations that folks have 
started to think like, well, how can we maximize profit out of these living beings? Um, confine them into this sort of Im impossible uh, scenarios of overcrowding and abuse, and then uh, have them grow as fast as possible, pumped with antibiotics and, and chemicals, and then slaughter them and just move them on. You know, we've really outsourced death in that way. And I think they're really two different things. I mean, the prairie would not sequester carbon without ruminants grazing it. It doesn't, the ecosystem doesn't work without ruminants. Right. And but they have to be at the appropriate stocking rates, which means in turn that we humans are eating meat at the rates that are appropriate for the ecosystem, which is going to be pretty rare. You know, meat has been culturally and historically a spice or it's been a special occasion um, food that you have when a, a special person is coming into the community. And that's how we practice animal agriculture. We practice it as a special occasion. You know, when we do our week long immersion, we have one meal that has chicken in it that we raised and killed together and prayed over. Uh, we have goats um, that survive entirely on native browse and fertilize our orchard um, and don't require, you know, bagged feed that came in from somewhere far away. So, so I, for me personally, it's very much a matter of scale um, and a matter of uh, right relationship. I don't participate in industrial animal agriculture and don't advocate for it. And I also think it's very important to, um, it's very, very important to make sure that um, in no way are we engaging in colonial evangelical veganism and telling indigenous people that they cannot have access to their historical relationship with uh, wild foods. Um, so that's very important to state also. Thank you for these really, really excellent questions. We have another one up front. Uh, so you're a 501c3. I wanted to ask you how much energy uh, do you spend on grant writing and development? And um, not every farm can be fronted by Leah Peniman. And what's your advice to <laughs> small farmers who uh, probably the last thing they can th they think about is going after grants and, 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 and funding. And by the way, listening to you for an hour, I'm ready to write you a check uh, <laughs> tonight, so. Oh, that's very kind of you. Um, don't write a check to us. I mean, you can if you want, but go to the reparations map on our, our website and there's uh, farms like ours across the country that need support. So um, can check them out and find one, find one near you. I would say, how much time do we spend on grant writing and fundraising? Um, we have 10 staff and one staff person spends half of her time on grant writing and fundraising. So that would be 5% of our collective effort as a community um, that's spent to answer just really directly. Um, and I totally agree. I don't think that small farms should become nonprofits and do grant writing. I mean, I, I do think that there is an untapped resource of community support. Um, and I talk to a lot of small farmers who say, you know, We'd really love to make our food accessible to low income people, but we can't afford to do that. And I said, even if you just email your customers who already are committed and say, hey, we'd love to establish a scholarship fund for our CSA or set aside 10% of our produce um, to give away through an institutional partner, could you kick in for it? We have seen success with community members stepping up with great enthusiasm to support um, these type of initiatives. And so that's sort of like fundraising light where you're just asking your existing community, can you write me a check? It's gonna go towards this purpose. And I think that would help um, small commercial farmers to be able to not sacrifice income, but set aside a portion of their harvest, uh, you know, to those who need it in their community. App earlier, that would be excellent to highlight on our social media platform so folks can see all of those great, um, projects. Um, so Leah has to log off in four minutes. Is that right? Do we have time for one more short question? Okay. Yeah, let's do one more. Do we have one more? Sure, right here. Hi, thanks so much for chatting with us. It's been really wonderful. Um, I'm wondering about your take on the balance between kind of providing immediate assistance to healthy, culture-appropriate food in 
communities that suffer from um, food apartheid, but at the same time not ignoring the structural issues that stand behind that, or even if you think that those two aren't even like contrary to each other and they kind of like go together. Um, I know it's a, not a four minute question, but thank you. <laughs> No, I mean, we could talk for days about all of these, right? And I think I'm the wrong person to ask because I'm always like both and, you know, on the one hand, we absolutely go door to door delivering food to people for free and building gardens um, and providing the, this direct, you know, survival programs, which is very much shout out to the Black Panther Party for that model of survival programs. They fed 20,000 children free breakfast every morning. Um, but at the same time, they were organizing for permanent systemic change. And we do that too, you know, where advocating around these policies, building institutions and coalitions, working on campaigns, educating the next generation. And I think the both end is really important and it's a false dichotomy because I don't know about you, but if I have like nothing in my belly, the last thing I'm gonna do is be like, oh, maybe I should run for office and make some change in my community, right? Where we have a hierarchy of human needs. And so if our basic needs for like food, shelter, clothing, safety, love are not met, it's very hard for us to step back and say, um, how am I going to change the system so that, you know, seven generations from now, our children have a place to, um, to live and to thrive. Um, and, and to the extent that we have capacity, I think that, no, I think we all have capacity. Like, even if your main focus is like survival programs, I think you could still lend, you know, 10 hours a year to big picture campaigns. And if your main focus is big picture campaigns, you can probably find 10 hours a year to go like deliver food to people. Um, and I think those, we need to be grounded in both of those perspectives, you know, in order to make the kind of change we need to see. Well, thank you so much to you all for your great questions and thank you to Leah. Thanks everyone. <laughs> Thanks Leah, it was such a privilege to hear your story and talk with you, thank you. Thank you Leah, to get here. For sure, yeah, right, yeah. for sure. <laughs> um, Courtney, thank you also. I wanted to thank Courtney specifically because one of the things we're really trying to do more of this year than in the past is engage with the students, staff, and faculty who are the College of the Atlantic throughout the, the nine months, and you've been a big help, so thank you for no that. So part of the benefit of being here, like in person, is that we get to wander up to the red bricks and, and have a drink, which I'd invite all of us to do. And tomorrow morning at 9.30, we're gonna have uh, Ruth Reichel and Sam Sifton. Sam's here already, I can see Sam somewhere. There's Sam, hi Sam. And so please join us again tomorrow morning. They're both Ruth and Sam will be here on stage. So um, I hope you can join us and let's go have a drink. Thanks everyone. Thanks.